Coming up, returning the indigenous name to a California state park, we hear from a community organizer who helped make this happen. Plus, President Joe Biden is getting pushback from his own party on his domestic agenda. How should tribal nations respond? I'm Patty Thoahungba. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tawahungva. A bipartisan group of lawmakers want to form a commission to investigate Indian boarding school policies. Senator Elizabeth Warren and representatives Sharice Davids and Tom Cole helped introduce the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian boarding school policies in the United States. The investigation will look into the government's attempts to terminate American Indian cultures, religions, and languages. Ruth Buffalo is a state representative from North Dakota. Buffalo also serves as the president of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. She says she's hopeful about the act, but knows there's a lot of work ahead. We are so excited and hopeful, but also remaining vigilant in understanding fully the work that is needed to carry out such a endeavor. Um, and so I really want to acknowledge and commend those who have gone before us and those who are still here who haven't given up on, on this work. The commission will also develop recommendations for Congress to aid in healing intergenerational trauma passed down in Native communities. Also in Washington, there's a push for a smoother working relationship between tribes and the Treasury Department. At the end of September, a group of five bipartisan U.S. senators sent a letter to Department of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. They're asking for the agency to, to establish the Treasury's first office of tribal affairs. In the letter, the senators cited a January memorandum from President Joe Biden that requires federal agencies conduct proper consultation with tribes. U.S. Senator Alex Padilla was one of the authors of the letter. He told Indian Country Today he hopes to make official and permanent offices of tribal affairs at all federal departments one day. So while we appreciate the executive order uh, and actions by uh, President Biden, we want to make sure that uh, you know we're in institutionalizing the level of uh, collaboration and cooperation by making permanent uh, these positions, starting with Treasury, but extending to uh, uh, departments and agencies throughout the federal government. The Treasury Department frequently works with tribal nations, especially with dispersing the funds allocated from coronavirus relief money. The senators have asked the Treasury Secretary to respond by October 13th. They say they have not received a formal response yet, but have, quote, positive signs. Dwindling numbers of Alaska salmon are leaving tribes along the Yukon River in a state of crisis. In a normal year, smokehouses and drying racks used by Alaska natives to prepare salmon for the winter would be full. However, for the first time in memory, people there say the king and chum salmon have been reduced to almost nothing. The state is banning salmon fishing on the Yukon, including subsistence harvests that tribal nations typically rely on for food in the winter. Alaska Native groups petitioning for federal aid would like more collaborative research on the effects ocean changes are having on fish. However, in the meantime, indigenous Alaskans are left scrambling to fill a hole in their diet and in centuries of tradition built around salmon. Politicians and Native leaders hope to fix some of the voting rights issues in Indian country. The National Congress of American Indians and the Native American Rights Fund held a voting rights roundtable called Addressing Barriers to Native American Voting Rights, a Tribal Federal Roundtable of Discussion. 
Issues they face uh, that face Indian country include access to polling sites, voting registration, and mailing ba mailing mail in ballots. U.S. Representative Sharice Davids of Kansas says the act they are introducing will help fix some of these issues. Uh, this is a piece of legislation that's going to address a bunch of the issues that that I was just speaking about, because. Um, at the end of the day, like we need to get this done in large part to fulfill our federal trust responsibility. The Native American Voting Rights Act proposed legislation includes improving access to voter registration and mandates acceptance of tribal IDs where IDs are required and establishes a voting task force. The act was introduced in the Senate in early August. Well, news from the beauty industry. Soon, a popular indigenous-owned beauty brand can be found at your local J.C. Penney store. J.C. Penney will begin uh, its own beauty se section with what the company calls a range of inclusive brands. The retailer announced last week one of the retailers chosen is Prados Beauty. Prados Beauty is owned by C.C. Meadows, a Chicana and indigenous entrepreneur. The company specializes in selling brightly colored eyeshadow palettes, brushes, and other products. It has been featured in publications like Vogue and Cosmopolitan. Prados Beauty released a statement saying it's excited for the opportunity and thanked supporters. This is happening as the retailer ends its current partnership with beauty conglomerate Sephora. J.C. Penney plans to launch its, its new beauty section in select stores in October with the goal to roll it out to all 600 of its stores by 2023. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholahungva. Coming up, Democratic divisions. How are they impacting the president's domestic agenda? We'll talk to Holly Cook Moncaro later in our show. But first, we hear from a man who worked to restore the Yurok name of a state park in Northern California. A state park in Northern California was known until last week as Patrick's Point. It was previously named after a homesteader who lived in the 1800s. He is believed to have murdered native people. The California State Parks and Recreation Commission voted unanimously last week to restore the park's Yurok name. It is now Sumeg State Park. Joining us now is Skip Lowry. He is a community organizer who's worked to restore the park's name. Welcome. Hello there. So tell us the story of how this Stark, uh, park's name came about as being changed. Well, it's uh, the park inherited that name from the homesteader, as you uh, mentioned. And ever since the park uh, was acquired by the state, um, they've just let it be. And no one's really took an action the native community here has always wanted the name to be changed, but the steps in the process is actually pretty challenging. You have to go through what's called the State Board of Commissions, Parks and Rec State Board of Commissioners, and uh, it has to go up through the chain of command through the secretary of the parks, the director of parks. Um, but thankfully, um, Governor Gavin Newsom put an initiative out a few years back called the Reexamining Our Past Initiative. And with that, state parks and California Department of Transportation is supposed to assess whether or not there are derogatory or hurtful names um, within their systems, within their structures and on their sites and locations. So we are the first state agency, um, state park to rename a park under this initiative. Um, it took the Yurok tribe uh, to write a letter and some and a lot of community support um, given to our district superintendent, and he took that up the chain of command all the way to the state board of commissioners. And uh, it happened fairly quick once the letter was in and the support was behind it. Um, myself and a lot of other community members did organizing in our local community for about two years. Um, we did Monday lunch on lunch breaks. Uh, we would meet and generated a lot of the support that the Yurok tribe uh, gained in this 
historic moment. There's always with these um, kind of different layers of support among tribal citizens and allies, it's like this moment of enormous pride. What's been the reaction from both that community and from the larger, uh, greater community around the park? Well, everybody I know at the park is happy for the change. A lot of the employees have stated so and, and give hugs, you know. There was a lot of, um, I'm still like emotional. I, I, I'm just so happy and thrilled and have no words to describe it. This this an unbelievable pressure off of uh, my, my existence, my soul. And so, the greater community, the I know the Yurok community is just thrilled. Um, our neighboring tribes, the Talawa and the Hoopa and the Karuk and the Wiat, are also just very supportive and and thrilled and look forward to um, utilizing this momentum and this precedent to make changes in their communities, uh, in their ancestral tribal territories. And so I'm looking forward to supporting that as well in the future. Um, but this is one big low-hanging fruit that we don't have to worry about anymore. Um, it's a healing place. Sumeg Village is a place for healing. It was designed that for, for that purpose by our traditional leaders um, who some of them didn't make it to see the village actually come to physical fruition. But the legacy that we're following in their footsteps with is just immense. And I know that they're, they're looking down happy and uh, really proud of all the community members that got together to um, demand this change and uh, encourage this healing effort. Is this a teaching moment for the community? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the, both the, the tribe and the general public is gonna learn a lot and heal a lot from, from this. Uh, it was not as easy. And like I said, our, our tribal neighbors um, will get to uh, maybe not make uh, some of the mistakes that, or the challenges that we came up against, uh, they won't have um, as a difficult time getting through those because we've done it. There's always that California paradox where more Native Americans live in California than any other state, yet the history has been brutal. And trying to balance both of those competing ideas, I think must be challenging. You know, unfortunately, the story um, about the genocide of California Indians specifically doesn't get taught in a lot of school systems um, in our K-12 systems. And so um, educating in a gentle way um, about truth, um, you know, if, if we were to want, um, let's say social justice and environmental justice, uh, we have to start with testimonial justice and testimony comes from the, from the source. Um, so our, when our community suffered the trauma that it did um, not that long ago, you know, California is not that old and we're the last community to be touched in the lower 48 states um, by westward, westward expansion um, and colonization. So it's only like three or four generations back where um, a lot of this bad stuff was happening to good people here, the native people, um, the original uh, people of the land. And so this is a another avenue for that uh, testimonial justice to happen, which will then create social justice, which we can build into environmental justice and create a healthier world for everybody to be a part of and, and appreciate. Along that path, what are kind of some of your next steps? Um, well, there's gonna be some celebrations. That's, uh, we already have some groups that wanna come into the village, uh, some local agency groups and non uh, government um, nonprofit organizations that work with native communities to support um, uh, the challenges that come with uh, confronting this type of um, often violent history in a healthy way. Uh, so there, there's going to be some healing ceremonies, uh, uh, some rejoicing. Um, and then there's just, you know, supporting our neighbors. There, there are lots of places within state parks and I would say national parks and uh, that, that, could use the effort that we did in the re-examining our past initiative. Uh, there, there is a lot more work to do. Um, I'm gonna take a little break, a rest, uh, but I'm gonna definitely support the, the Weot people um, and the Talua and the, our Karuk and Hupa neighbors when um, they wanna make a, an effort and a change in their communities. We will be there with them. 
In terms of righting these old wrongs, there's so many uh, areas to go, but you think about parks, but you also think about the names of cities and statues and all of the public uh, expressions of that past. Um, how do you pri prioritize this? That's a good question. It is hard to prioritize. Um, I think if you can um, target something that affects the youth, the children, because that's what um, I'm so happy about and emotional about is that um, going to Sumake my whole life, you know, since I was 10 was when it was built, this village was recreated um, for the healing of uh, our community and our future um, from the recent trauma. The, uh, like my boys know the story. Um, I've gone to Patrick's Point and gone to healing ceremonies and had that name hanging over me and my cultural uh, existence my whole life, as long as I've known. And it's been a burden, it's, it's painful to, uh, to have that. And my kids know about that pain, but their kids, my grandkids, aren't gonna know that. They're not gonna have to deal with that. So we're, we're healing the future is really what's important. It does make me feel good, but I'm really struck that um, the children, the youth in the future aren't gonna have to, this, we've done some work for them and then they'll, they'll be energized to do whatever work they need to, to carry on um, revitalizing our culture, um, healing the world, keeping the world in balance. The uh, Yurok culture was placed in this geographic place uh, by creation. Um, for the purpose of creating world balance and being in tune and in touch with nature in a harmonious way. And we were existed that way for tens of thousands of years, millennia. And in a really brief time, we were impacted and hurt. And now we're healing uh, from that, from those impacts and uh, sharing our story. Spe speaking of feeling good, um, where were you, were you when you got the news and how did you react? It was funny because the the, the, the commission um, meeting was on a Thursday and uh, I had scheduled, I work uh, as an interpreter for, for the park as well, um, but uh, I was at work and um, doing a tour and it, I was in between tours on my lunch break um, when I got the text message and uh, I was at a Murphy's Market and I just started crying and uh, there was another park employee that was there and she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I was like, I just got word that the the, yeah, the commission voted unanimously 5-0 in favor of changing the name. Uh, so she gave me a big hug, you know, and um, getting emotional right now thinking about it because it was, it was striking. It came at just a random time, but um, whew, what a feeling. What's the lesson for other tribes? Um, I would say just believe in yourself, believe in your testimony. Your voices have power. The youth is strong. Um, focus on them and uh, bridge the gaps between cultures because um, we have a lot to offer. Skip, thank you so much. Absolutely. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Blessings. When we come back, an update from Washington, D.C. We'll be right back. It's crunch time for President Joe Biden's domestic agenda, and he's facing opposition, not just from Republicans, but within his own party. To tell us how this impacts tribal nations, we have Holly Cook Makara with us today. She's a partner with Spirit Rock Consulting and a regular contributor to our news program. Welcome, Holly. Hi, Mark, it's good to see you. So there's a lot going on both above the surface and below the surface in Washington. Let's start by the really tense negotiations about whether or not uh, we have a reconciliation process and a budget. Yes, that will uh, today. That will remain to be seen today. We are going to uh, see the Senate Republicans. Um, they are preparing to filibuster the Democrats' latest bid to raise the debt ceiling. Yesterday, they successfully blocked the. Um, it was a combination bill that would have both suspended the debt ceiling and. Um, funded the government through uh, through December. So the, the debt ceiling suspension would have been through December of 2022. So not that they were, as, as McConnell has indicated um, all along, 
they uh, blocked that bill. And so now today is it is up to Majority Leader Chuck Schumer from New York to come back with um, another effort at this. And um, we are unclear how this is going to unfold. There are a number of, or, well, not, there's actually not a number of options. There are a couple of options for Senator Schumer here. He can amend the budget resolution that would allow for um, the debt ceiling language to go through on its own, or they can wrap it up into this larger reconciliation bill. But there have been indications that would make it very difficult, um, further make, um, complicate the path forward for the reconciliation bill. So these, um, these shenanigans in the Senate, they do have implications for Indian country, particularly um, in the reconciliation bill. There are significant tax provisions in that bill that affect Indian country. And while the debt ceiling might seem a bit um, as if it might not have any impacts, but when, but when the government hits the debt ceiling, which is really they're, they're, they're paying for prior obligations. This is, this is not a new authorization for spending, which um, that may be part of the argument. But when they can no longer borrow funds, when they can no longer meet the obligations, um, existing obligations, they usually will, may have to suspend paying um, our members of the military, which as we all know, there are a significant number of Native Americans that serve in the military. There are benefit payments that may have to be suspended. There are federal workers and in Indian country, all of those things would have an impact. So not only is the debt ceiling something that we should be watching and encouraging our senators to um, work together on. This is really, I think, I thought Senator Dick Durbin um, of Illinois, the number two Democrat in the Senate had a great point that we shouldn't be able to filibuster the Senate, which brings actually back to me that there is a third option. They can restrict the use of the filibuster in the Senate um, to things um, more, more standard legislation, not um, what should be joint and nonpartisan requirements to fund the government's obligations. And that gets into the complexity of having two Democrats that go back and forth on things like the filibuster, uh, Joe Manchin and, uh, and Sienema. Um, how do you get that broad consensus? Well, uh, if, if, if you or I knew that, <laughs> I think we would have to be in, in with Senator Chuck Schumer, Schumer right now trying to figure that out. Um, Senator Biden was, was what I understand, very, um, very clear in his meeting. Uh, he did a Zoom meeting with the, with the Senate Democratic Caucus yesterday and, and himself expressed frustration with um, the back and forth with what are our more most conservative Democratic members of the Senate. So they're as right, snug against the line, Joe Manchin uh, of West Virginia and Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. Um, one of those states has a significant number of tribes in it, obviously, Arizona. And uh, so I'm, I'm certain they are weighing in as well. But these are, they have both been very clear. They're in no way ready to um, vote to support, to do away with the filibuster. So that leaves, you know, just a couple of options for Senator Schumer. Um, what has really surprised me in this whole debate about the filibuster that they're really pushing it on this is that if, if they were to change the Senate rules, and you know, go nuclear is what they call it, and do away with the filibuster. As 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 you all know, uh, the filibuster really it is when when a bill is brought to the floor, it requires sixty votes to pass cloture, which just means it allows the allows it to proceed to a, to a full vote on the actual bill. It's really just a motion to proceed. So, but it, it's key because once you get past that that filibuster, that sixty vote threshold then you only need 50 votes to pass the bill. So the cloture vote or the filibuster, where, which is often filibustered, is, is really the key, key spot there. But the fact that they're doing it on the debt ceiling and not on, on something as monumental as the voting rights legislation, for instance, um, is, is really confusing to me. I, I, um, if they push it on this, I, then I, the floodgates open. Then we get then we get voting rights legislation. We get those those 
uh, pieces of Democratic legislation that um, that Senate Democratic House and Senate Democratic leadership are pushing. But things like the voting rights legislation have huge impacts in Indian country. So there are there are some long term things that we are that we can be looking at here as they consider how to pass this debt ceiling. While it may not seem on its face as if it has much impact on Indian country, there certainly is in the long term. One point I do want to make and get your reaction to is that the Senate is really not a very democratic institution. Only 16% of the country can elect a majority of the Senate. <laughs> yes, I, do, I assume you mean small d. But yes, the um, it is not as if the in the House where, you know, simple majority rules really, and it's the worst place to be in the minority. But the um, one senator can really stop the entire show. And as we're seeing now, two senators are stopping the entire show and keeping the entire country um, on the edge of their seats as we watch whether the government will be funded and whether the country can meet its obligations. So again, you know, Indian country has some things to watch. There's important provisions in there for us as well, even though on its face, um, it seems as if it's very high level. Always fascinating. Holly Cook McCarl, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.